when we uh, started planning this uh, uh, conference, it was uh, very important uh, to have uh, the people from Silicon Valley and the West Coast and high tech here. Uh, and in order to do that, we also wanted to have a moderator and that is very well versed and experienced. And I'd like to introduce the next panel and specifically uh, Adam Leshinsky, who is going to moderate the panel. Adam is the uh, executive editor of Fortune, but uh, before assuming the role of uh, editorship of Fortune, he was uh, one of the most important tech uh, journalists and reporters in Silicon Valley for the past uh, 25 years, uh, so he has a perspective of how the valley has changed, uh, is in changing in the last few decades. Adam, please. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Turn my mic. There we go. Okay. I saw a green light. Can you hear me? No? Yes? Can you hear me? Great. Guy, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, Two quick personal notes. I, among my uh, many many roles, being a friend of Guy Rolnick's is one of my favorites. So it's a it's a privilege to be here, and it was just a great privilege. I, I'm sure this panel will pale in comparison to your speech just now, Mr. Monkey. That was that that was so so exhilarating. Thank you. Okay, we um, we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, I want to start by uh, by making brief introductions uh, to, of our panel. And then I'll frame up what we're going to talk about. We have we have a lot of we have plenty of time to air this out, and then I'll go to the panel and ask them to uh, to start to start mixing it up. Um, I want to we'll we'll leave time at the end for questions, but um, I like to say that if you feel like you have a burning desire to ask a question before the Q and A time, it's a small room. Raise your hand, make yourself make, make, let me see you, and 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 jump in. This this can be a group conversation, which I'm sure everybody would want. Now. Um, uh, on, my, on my far right, to your left, is Elver Kosovic, who is a managing director and co-head of Houlihan Loki's tech and IP advisory practice. Good so far? So far, so Okay, good. I'm so uh, obsessed with getting names wrong. Um, he, had an, uh, he, he previously was at a boutique investment bank called Blackstone. <laughs> was that ever a problem? No. Okay. And, and he's an expert, uh, and he's an expert on, on patent law. Um, sitting next to me is, is Matt. Peralt, I have to skip to the P's. I know you have these in your, in, your, uh, in your folders, but I just want to highlight a few things. Matt is director of public policy at Facebook. He's led the company's global public policy planning efforts on issues such as law enforcement and human rights, and he oversaw public policy for WhatsApp, Oculus, and Facebook. He worked for Congress and for the World Bank. And given the topic of our conversations these two days, he's a very brave and gracious man to be here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sitting to immediately to my left is Albert Wanger, who is a venture capitalist. They have some culpability here as well. He's a partner at Union Square Ventures in New York. Um, he was president of Delicious through the company's sale to Yahoo. He's been an angel investor in Etsy and Tumblr and has a really great perch on all of the topics that we're talking about today. And, and last but not least, do you want to say whale? Wild. Okay, got it wrong. <laughs> ben Wild is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England whose work aims to use technology and economics to find new ways to organize societies to reduce inequality, increase productivity, and ease political tensions. He's visiting Yale University as a visiting senior research scholar and lecturer in the economics department and the law school. And he shortly has a new book out, which is very relevant to our topic this morning. And, and, and we're gonna, I'm going to actually ask him to kick things off in a moment. Um, uh, any, any good moderator takes directions from their host, and I want to tell you exactly what Guy told me we should accomplish this morning. Um, <laughs> do the large digital platforms, the big five, which I know you discussed yesterday, with their huge value and power inhibit innovation? How would the world look if we had more players and less concentrated power? Second, is the tech industry becoming rigid, as rigid as old traditional industries, meaning large, do large companies have a significant power to limit competition? Three, what happens to venture capital and formation of new companies and technologies in a landscape that is dominated by these, this very small handful of companies? 
And, and lastly, will, will the founders and CEOs of these companies go down in history as leaders of the brave new world or as the robber barons of the 21st century? Guy, I think that's the journalist in you, not the academic in you, in you asking that question. So Glenn, I want to ask you to, to kick us off and frame, frame the debate by telling us about um, what you're going to be saying in your new book and what your research has been about and how you see this topic. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Adam. So uh, the broader argument, or a broader argument of my book is that there are a uh, range of areas that uh, antitrust policy has for the last uh, 30, 40 years uh, been sort of categorically neglecting. Uh, I'm less focused on the areas along the edges, uh, but there are, I think, a number of areas that have been categorically neglected. And one of those areas that's, I think, most relevant to this uh, discussion is potential competition. Um, there have been, uh, as I'm sure you're all uh, aware, a number of potential competition cases prior to roughly the 1970s. But since then, there's been a dramatic decline in interest in pursuing potential competition cases. And I think this is incredibly relevant to the startup ecosystem because the nature of creative destruction style competition and uh, uh, disruptive innovation is that at uh, most of the even reasonably mature stages of the developments of these startups, it's pretty unclear what the trajectory of their impact on the industry is going to be. And much of the job of people uh, like uh, Albert is precisely uh, to figure out what are different scenarios of how the industry might potentially develop. And that is really just not consistent with the sorts of tools that are typically applied in uh, antitrust analysis, which generally focuses on measurement either of existing markets or easily predictable future markets. And um, uh, I think that's led to a number of mergers uh, being approved such as uh, Instagram with WhatsApp and Facebook, DoubleClick uh, and Waze with Google, uh, Skype even with Microsoft, uh, my own uh, company, I think is another one of these, where there, there was, I think, a quite plausible case that had those companies not been absorbed, they might have changed the texture of the way that competition took place within those relevant marketplaces. And then, in fact, the prospect of that happening was uh, part of the basis of the funding and expansion of those companies. And uh, the um, lack uh, of imagination, I might say, among antitrust enforcers in thinking about those potential paths, how many of those involve complementarities between the companies, how many of those involve potential disruptions to the industry, um, I think has been uh, really problematic for the ability of this economy to generate the sort of innovation that is claimed for it. So um, I think that that's a, an issue that we should all debate and uh, be thinking about, but is uh, pretty important to antitrust policy in the industry going forward. So Glenn, at the outset of this panel, I'm going um, I'm going to give you uh, tremendous power. Okay, and. Um, but, but, but before, I, before I do that, I, I thought what was so valuable, what the takeaway I had from Mr. Monty's comments is that, uh, you know, the American system of the, this, this terribly messy system of two federal uh, powers plus the 50 states, it's, it's really purposely designed to make things happen slowly. Yeah. And so you're making the case that antitrust uh, um, policy has, has, has evolved slowly, too slowly. But I'll just point out that was, that was more or less by design. But Go ahead. You you now have two minutes to make to make the policy as it should be. Please tell us what what you would promulgate next month. I mean, I I would have uh, perhaps fewer uh, economists and more uh, and more venture people who think like venture capitalists, uh, or maybe economists who learn to think like venture capitalists would be more relevant. I'd really like to see uh, people analyzing potential trajectories for the industry thinking about low probability events, and thinking about among those low probability events, which are the most plausible. And you know, maybe that sounds imponderable, but you know, people manage to do it for a living, and they actually sometimes make some money doing that. And um, if, if, that's, if that's true, uh, I don't see a reason why we can't 
learn to uh, think and behave in that way. And I, and I just, I don't think it's such a hard thing to do. I mean, you take uh, 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 the example of Skype versus another acquisition that Microsoft did, which was Minecraft. Minecraft, it turned out ex post, it wasn't clear at the time, there was a very clear complementarity that was driving the Minecraft acquisition, which was the HoloLens. It, it, it was secret, but that could have been disclo disclosed secretly to antitrust authorities. But that was, it was, that was clearly why we bought uh, uh, Minecraft Expos. Um, and so it would have been easy to make the case for why that one should have flown. On the other Sh hand, should not have flown. Should have flown. Should have flown because it was, there was a clear complementarity between uh, Minecraft and HoloLens. And I, I just, I don't, I think any, one evaluating that would have seen the case for that, would have seen that Minecraft didn't compete with any major titles that we owned. It didn't compete with Halo or anything like that. And, and there would have been a clear case. On the other hand, Skype, I think, is a case that you should have thought about much more carefully. Because there's clear ways in which Skype, for example, competes with m significant other Microsoft products like uh, Link, what's now Skype for Business, and uh, could potentially have disrupted the role that Microsoft played in being central to business communications. So I think that, I just don't think this is so in incredibly difficult. Yes, you can't go and run a demand estimation, but I mean, how many, how reliable are the sort of demand estimations anyway? You know, I, I'm not sure that, that you would actually rely on those to make your own business planning decisions. We don't rely on them that much at Microsoft to make our business planning decisions. So uh, why can't we think uh, as, in an, as agile of a way as the industry does? Okay, very good. Um, Elver, I want to ask you to, to go next and also um, frame up this debate from <coughs> your perspective, which is uh, largely focused on, on patents. That's right. So um, I come at it from uh, um, a very background. I was an academic earlier uh, in my career at Yale, uh, invented patents, worked on DARPA research projects, did fun stuff, smashing the atoms to see what happens. Uh, and then when I uh, became an entrepreneur and actually wrote a bunch of patents and built uh, medical device companies uh, that were sold to large medical device companies. And then worked for those large medical device companies, buying other pat other companies with uh, with patents, and then shifted to uh, investment banking, uh, where I now help uh, uh, a number of the companies. And in the interest of full disclosure, some of the companies we're talking about here are our current clients now. Um, what I see happening in the patent system is uh, is extremely unusual. Uh, for one, uh, the patent system is kind of tucked away in its little world. And most patent conferences are attended only by patent people, and patent people don't go to other people's conferences. Uh, so it's a, it, it, it's a little world that lives kind of on its own, and, and I find it, uh, that, that the general public just doesn't understand what's really going on. Excuse me, I have to interrupt you and tell you a very quick, funny anecdote. I run a, a very large technology conference in Aspen called Brainstorm, Fortune Brainstorm Tech. And last year, I, I was interviewing uh, General Stanley McChrystal, and he looked out over the audience and he said, how many active military duty, how many active duty military people are there? And of course, there were none. And he said, you really need to have active duty military people in next year. You should have 15. And I said, well, I won't commit to 15, but I'll commit to five. And I'm listening to you speak, and maybe we need to have patent lawyers <laughs> as well to help them. But go ahead, please. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's important because these issues flow down to innovation, right? What happens is, as we change patent policy, to make things work for or against certain companies, right? And, and everybody throws, the, there's, there's um, bomb throwing in the patent market uh, that happens and then it spills over uh, through PR into the general discourse. So uh, the one group of companies is calling everybody who owns patents, patent trolls, uh, right? It used to be, I was proud of having patents. Now I have to explain that mm. when I sold my companies, I sold the technologies that also had patents. Uh, to distinguish myself, especially in Silicon Valley, especially since I'm still the only guy in Silicon Valley who wears a tie, mm -hmm. uh, to say, hey, look, I'm not a patent troll. Uh, we're not a patent troll. So there's, there's this whole discourse on patent trolls. On the other hand, if you talk am uh, amongst the companies that build a lot of technology, you know, pick Ericsson, Qualcomm, whatever, uh, the, the, the label they're trying to grab is that everybody else is an efficient infringer. The concept of efficient infringement is that it doesn't cost you anything to infringe. Whether you do a, a license deal now, or you go ahead and infringe for five years and you get sued because we removed the injunctions with the eBay case, the Supreme Court, and, and uh, you're an, an infringer and you get sued, 
um, and, and you have found to, uh, to have been um, infringing, you'll still pay the same as you would have paid in the beginning. So you have nothing to lose. Right? So you're better off just infringing. As a matter of fact, it might be less expensive for you to, to infringe than, than, uh, than to pay royalties given how the, you know, the current uh, case law is, is set up. So uh, unfortunately, what's happened is some of this has trickled down. And when I talk to young engineers today, what's shocking to me is how little they understand economics and how little they understand that the patents actually protect them, right? Without patents, an engineer is an Uber driver, right? It's a race to the bottom, working by the hour. And with patents, an engineer has the, the intellectual right, uh, capacity to produce something and then protect it and then build a business around it and go forward. And I'll end uh, by noting that what's curious to me about uh, the patent system, and we'll talk about it more later, is that typically large companies have abused the patent system to, uh, to preserve their position. Uh, but here what we're seeing is the largest companies are, uh, for the most part, clearly on the anti-patent side. Uh, and that's curious. Uh, why is that? Uh, part of it is that, that they're mostly implementers of, of uh, technologies. But it's different. Right? You can't just say all big tech is the same. It's very different. Facebook is very different than Apple. So they're both big tech companies, but Apple has a lot of hardware. Facebook doesn't have a lot of hardware. And I don't say that just because you care. <laughs> uh, but they, they uh, it's just it, uh, patents in software are not as important as, as they are in hardware because things move faster. It's harder to patent things and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is that many companies have, uh, uh, on, uh, the big companies, including Intel, Microsoft, uh, and, and the big tech that we talked about here uh, earlier, a lot of them have shifted to the anti-patent side, which is really curious. Uh, Microsoft used to run uh, you know, a really strong patent program. It made over a billion dollars a year on licensing the Android system, even though they theoretically failed in mobile. Uh, right? That's a popular narrative. But they've done a really nice job there. But even Microsoft has, in their public statements and in joining various groups, has stepped back from patent enforcement. I'm saying, what is happening here? This is really unusual. So would, would you just finish the point? Why is, why is that? Why exactly have they done that? Uh, well, one theory is, I'm, I'm not an antitrust expert. I took one class in law school on antitrust. Uh, but one, uh, it's like my knowledge of accounting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, one theory is that uh, they're mostly on the, on the implementer side, and that given that they're so big, there's so other effects that are going on, the network effects and the size effects, that net-net patents actually work against you mm -hmm. if you're that large. That's my uh, layman's interpretation. Patents actually work against you because, because all, all that can happen is the middle market companies who are your suppliers can then extract you know, kind of a, 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 either a high price or a reasonable price or whatever, a different price than they can if they have no patent protection. Go ahead, Glenn, and then I want to ask Oliver a question. I, I just wanted to add to that that um, you know, it's not just uh, uh, patents. It's uh, a whole range of IP. And I, I would count data in with that, right. that these companies have profited by trying to reduce the value associated with because they are in a position to effectively control access to that resource and use of that resource rather than trying to control the resource itself mm. uh, in the ownership rights. Okay, so before we move on, what I want to ask you, Albert, to frame for the Friend for the audience, and, and and this is a question that I'm going to that I'm going to ask the three of you as well, which is I'm trying to understand ex what exactly the problem is. So, what number one, what would you do differently? Well, what should be done differently, in your opinion? But, but secondly, where is the case that any of this is harming innovation? Because from my perspective, we're living in an a in an era of like of innovation that like we like no one like like has never happened before. So, and, and I'm ready, for, I'm prepared for you to, to disagree, but um, that if, that, if my statement is right, then there's no problem. If my statement is wrong, then there's a problem. But go ahead. Your statement is grossly wrong. Great. Totally yeah. agree. Great. Totally that wrong. that totally is my agree. job here. Good. Uh, how it's hurting innovation is, uh, um, first of all, the label of innovation got, uh, used to be the, the small companies, right? The, the guy who invented the windshield wiper, right? That was the innovator, right? The guy in the garage, <laughs> or the lady in the garage, or the... Uh, whatever, that, that invented X, Y, Z. Uh, and now the label of innovation has been grabbed by big tech. And when you think of innovators, it, a big tech says, well, we're the innovators. Yeah, but you're not really inventing any drugs. You're not really building any medical devices. You're not really doing a lot of really important stuff in clean energy and all kinds of really fun and important critical stuff that we need to have. 
right now you're innovating in ad models. Okay, that's nice. Right, you're making a lot of staking money from Madison Avenue. Okay, that's interesting. But are you solving some real problems? And a lot of large companies are starting to. Are right? you kidding me? I can turn this phone on without uh, without touching it. There, it's <laughs> really important. It just, right? it just worked. Right. That's exactly right. You can't just walk down. IKEA furniture. Country. That's right. Okay, but, uh, but no, no. It's really what's really yeah. happening. is, all joking aside, yeah. and I see this firsthand. Is yeah. small companies no longer have um, access to patent protection. So uh, when I built my first mm. medical device company, I talked to Thermo Electron, which is a huge Fortune 500, they offered me $300,000 for my business, and I just raised $5 million and spent it uh, from premier venture capitalists. And then I said, look guys, but I have the patent. I mean, this, you're not going to be able to do this. And it took a year or so. They signed a license with a 30% royalty, and in about three or four years, they bought the entire business, uh, solely on the patents. And then throughout my career, it was, it was always the patents that made the big difference. And, and the little guy fighting against the big guy, you have the patents. Now you don't have that. And it's moved so badly that it's not even the, middle, the small guys anymore. It's the middle market companies. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of cases, I'll give you an example, that mm -hmm. Apple did. Um, so one company called Immersion. So if you have a Fitbit, you have a Fitbit. How does your Fitbit communicate to you? Through Bluetooth. Uh, well, it vibrates on your wrist. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. right? So that technology was largely invented by a, a middle market company called Immersion. Been yeah, around yeah. for 20 years, yeah. has 1,000 patents. They do all the vibration, haptic yeah. feedback, all of your phones that vibrate, they invented all of that stuff. So Apple worked with them, paid them a license for years. Apple last year just decided to stop paying. They just said, no, we'll just do it ourselves. Well, you can't just do it yourself because we've been teaching you how to do it for the last yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Apple stopped, the market cap you know, dropped yeah. 60%. And Apple now did a piddly settlement with this company for, for peanuts. And the company is really in a lot of pain. It used to be a $500 million company. Now, you talk to a lot of people in Silicon Valley, they'll say, well, yeah, haptics is not important, it's not an important feature, they're a troll. No, this is a real company, it yeah. employs 100 American engineers, yeah. more serious company. Go ahead, question, and then I have one too. It's exactly this point. Why do you say that small companies don't have patent protection? They don't, because they, when they go, uh, uh, so we've had uh, several changes in the law uh, that happened. So, uh, you know, patents are really important. They're, they're at the heart of, of our democracy and business. They were discussed by Jefferson uh, and, and, and Madison uh, in uh, 1788. Uh, in the, you know, it was in the Federalist Papers, right? There was a lot of discussion. Should we have patents? Should we not have patents? You know, the Crown in England granted patents. It, that's why we have the concept of royalty, right? It was, you know, patents were given kind of on a whim to friends of the Crown. And there was a big discussion once you flip to a democratic system, what should we do with patents? And are they good or bad? And after much discussion was put in the Constitution, Jefferson wasn't so sure about it. But later uh, came around to Madison's view of things, and you know ran the patent office and did a, a lot of interesting okay, things. Okay, so I'm going to make you the same offer I made, Glenn. Ch change the system for us right now. What do you do? Uh, so in uh, fast forward a number of years, uh, we created the Federal Circuit in 1982, which is the appeals court for all of the patent cases that come from this report. Uh, but then in 2011, we passed the law that Obama signed called the America Invents Act. That law created a massive number of problems. It was really interesting. My old boss at Yale, Richard Levine, wrote um, or ran a report. Congress commissioned the National Academies of Engineering, the National Academies of Science, and the Institute of Medicine to opine on what should the patent policy be. So they produced this 400-page serious economic study and said we should do X, Y, and Z. The law didn't implement that. So why did Congress go and ask uh, people to go do stuff that just through lobbying didn't show up in the law? The biggest problem right now in patents is in an effort to deal with patent trolls, and there are indeed real patent trolls, yeah. right? That guys yeah. and, and, and folks that buy cheap patents and sue 20,000 people. Real problem, right? No question, it's a serious problem. In an effort to deal with that problem, which is a serious problem, we've eviscerated patents for small companies and even middle market companies and not even large companies. Apple doesn't want to pay Qualcomm. So are you saying that, what ne that the law as it exists needs to be enforced? Or that we need um, new laws uh, we need, we in the need U.S. New laws. We need new laws in the U.S. There's um, uh, it, what's what's interesting is even after American Vents Act, what happened is uh, it established what some in the industry call a kangaroo court. What the former judge at uh, former chief judge of the Federal Circuit, Judge Rader, called a death squad of patents. Mm. It established a little court in the patent office called the PTAP, Patent Trials and Appeals Board, that's killing patents that it issued. Right, so issued valid patents, it's killing them at an 80% rate. Because thank and, God. I'm sorry? I said thank God. Yeah, let me, Ellen, let me stop, <laughs> let me stop you there. Thank you, Ellen, for bringing it. We'll, we'll, we'll come
come back. What the hell do you mean by that? First of all, no, Albert, I'm kidding. So t <laughs> t tell, us, uh, tell us your thoughts, and, and I want you to frame it first of all. Uh, by start by saying from your position as a venture capitalist is, 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 is our thesis valid? Is there too much concentration in the hands of the big five? Without a doubt, there's too much power. Um, I mean, we, you know, the, the scale of these companies and their impact on what can be funded and what can succeed is massive. Um, you know, um, pretty much everything that we look at, we, we have an annual um, summit where we bring our portfolio company founders and CEOs together. And last year, um, this didn't come from us, this came from one of the entrepreneurs. We were talking about, you know, what kind of things do you see? And, and the word that came up is, well, I'm on, because they angel invest. So the, the CEO said, I'm only investing in things that are not in the Facebook, Apple, Amazon, um, kill zone, Google kill zone. I mean, that's the word this founder used. Um, the kill zone. And that's a real thing. Um, you know, so, and I, unless you want to conclude that Facebook is somehow the end state of how we communicate online and share socially, <laughs> um, I think that's kind of a bad thing. So um, now, my view here is that um, I think Glenn has an interesting thought around you know seeing a more dynamic view of the system as opposed to more of a static view. Uh, I think the other big issue is the focus on consumer harm versus the focus on innovation no, and, and thinking about um, monopoly power. And then I think the other big issue, the really big issue, is think about what the regulatory means are that are um, at the disposal of, of regulators. Um, so uh, we were investors, first investors in Twitter. Um, and in its earliest incarnation, Twitter was really just an API. And anybody could build a Twitter client. Um, and you know, we had invested a low cost basis, but invested relatively little money. But then Twitter wound up raising a lot of money. And then um, there was a company called Uber Media. Uber Media was buying up Twitter clients. Um, it was Bill Gross's company, came out of Idealab. And Bill came to Twitter and basically said, you know, look, we um, have a lot of Twitter clients and we basically want you to cut us in on the ad revenue because otherwise we're going to fork the network. And uh, because Twitter had raised a lot of money, um, Twitter blinked and we were like, oh, well, well, you can't let that happen. And so Twitter shut off all the Twitter clients and instead created a monoculture where there's just one Twitter client, which is the Twitter app itself. Um, in a nearby parallel universe, there is another Twitter that is today a federated system where there are lots of Twitter clients and you can choose how you want to view the timeline, who you want to follow, and where Twitter, the company, has very little power that it can exercise over the ecosystem. So where does that lead me? I think regulators need to think about APIs and regulators need to think about how can I, as a consumer, interact with the services that are out there, right? So um, today, Every one of us carries a supercomputer in their pocket. And that <coughs> supercomputer you pay for, um, and you pay for the power to charge it, um, or you take the university's power. Um, you pay for the data plan, or your company pays for it. But something very strange happens. You hit the app icon of any of these apps, and this supercomputer stops working for you and just works for that company, basically. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. no programmatic control uh, over your interactions. And so we find ourselves in the situation where we as individuals operate our thumbs and the brain between our ears, and on the other side are millions of servers. And that's a fundamental um, uh, asymmetry that I think results in much of that power. Um, the Facebook's position is not contestable by a new startup because when I as a new startup come in, I can't create software that would let people participate simultaneously without extra effort in both my system and Facebook's system because Facebook can shut me out. Um, there's something really interesting happening in the EU where bank accounts have to come with an API. And that's very new regulation. And that's resulting in a lot of very fast innovation. So uh, for instance, in the UK, there's a company called TrueLayer. And TrueLayer makes uh, bank accounts programmable. And it's resulting in a lot of innovation in the financial services sector because now I, as a consumer, can sort of say, yes, I can authorize this other third-party app, uh, for instance, for investing purposes, to interact programmatically with my account. Very interesting. And my view of what we should do from a regulatory perspective to deal with the power of these large digital enterprises is not to roll out tools from the industrial age, mm. but to create new tools that are germane to the digital age. So let me, uh, let me drill down w with you. You don't want to just create 
uh, new, new tools, you want to mandate new tools. And so when you, when you gave your Twitter example, I was thinking, you know, I need to remind you we're at the University of Chicago and Twitter was trying to make money and they built the platform. So, you know, and of course, you know, I, I, I don't mean to sound too ad adversarial. It was a I'm, great investment I'm, for us. <laughs> right, well, and I'm, but I'm role playing with you. Your suggestion would have, would have neutered Twitter and would have made it impossible for Twitter to pursue its, uh, its God given capitalist right to become a multi billion dollar market cap company. Yeah, so, I mean, interestingly enough, I think Twitter could still be probably a you know, multi-billion dollar market cap company, um, you know, we are a smaller fund when we invest at the valuations we do. If something becomes worth one or two billion dollars, it's still a great success for us. It doesn't need to be worth 20 or 200 billion dollars. Um, so I think there are uh, many ways in the model that I just described where companies can still make money and uh, where people are still going to want to start those things. But I, I, I wanted to yep. um, talk very briefly about the reason we would need to mandate APIs is because we have other laws that make it impossible to do this. So you could always try to regulate by addition or regulate by subtraction, right? right? So um, I'm an engineer, and I could actually take the code that Facebook sends to me, and I could extract Facebook's encryption keys, and I could write this API for myself, because Facebook's app actually communicates with Facebook via an API. The problem is if I did that, I'd be breaking two separate laws, each of which with federal mandatory prison sentences. I would be um, uh, violating the anti-circumvention provision of the DMCA, and I would be violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So the reason we cannot, as consumers, create these APIs for ourselves is because the law prevents us from doing so. So you're making the case we should change those laws. Well, I, I think we could go one of two directions. We could do away with those, and then yep. people can go service themselves, or we could create a new one, which is a mandate. I'm, I'm, I think I'd be open in both directions. Historically, we've not done very well at removing laws. <laughs> right. I'm coming to Matt in a moment. I want you to um, address the situation in venture capital that, that is the premise of, of, of this conversation. Um, and and to, to two questions. So the, the, the first one is this, this kill zone concept that, that you mentioned is, is fascinating. Number one, is that new? And, and, and two, I'm going to ask you the ultimate journalist question, which is, which is so what? I mean, your industry, I think I read it, the U.S. industry raised $30 billion last year. Your the evidence suggests you're going to invest it well and you're going to make money. If that means that you're going to have to sell the Facebook, who cares? Why, why, is that, why is that the consumer's problem or anybody's problem for that matter? Well, I, a lot of the, first of all, venture capitalists and capacity industry, when most venture capitalists raised, it means the returns will be the worst. So I would suggest uh, that this will not be a particularly good um, vintage. But um, uh, leaving that aside for a moment, uh, I, I think that um, the issue really is about um, stuff that doesn't even see the light of day because yeah. nobody even tries to do okay, it. And fair. the yep. kill zone mm -hmm. isn't a new thing. Microsoft had that when it had its platform monopoly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's a similar playbook where you know, Microsoft would see what kind of things are doing well on my platform and then they would just absorb those into the platform itself. Uh, and you know, that is a playbook that's being exercised by Amazon, by Google, by Facebook, by all the big digital platforms. Okay, good. Matt, you've been patient. Um, give, give, a, give us your thoughts on everything you've heard so far. I told you yesterday or day before that I, I wasn't going to say to you, so this is all your fault. Tell us why, tell us why that's wrong, but go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, thought, I, thought, I, I thought you were going to say, but I now need to tell you this no. is all your fault. No. Um, I'd like to thank Guy and Sebastian for including me in the event, and despite the sentiments of people in the room about Facebook, I hope we get invited back. It's been a really um, wonderful opportunity to learn and hear from all of you um, over the last day, so thank you. Um, I joined Facebook in January 2011, and the week that I joined the company, Egypt turned off the internet. And so one of the first jobs that I had in working for Facebook was actually to help develop the way that we were thinking about governments disrupting the ability for people to access the internet. And at that time, during the interview process, I thought a lot about our mission of making the world more open and connected. And to be honest, despite getting the job at Facebook, I wasn't really exactly sure what that mission statement meant. My first week in the job, when Egypt turned off the internet, I had a real sense of what that mission statement meant. And the next few years for us at the company were really focused on trying to further that concept of openness. And despite the fact that I think many people probably thought it was sort of a flippant mission statement, I thought the, the um, events in Egypt actually illustrated 
the radical proposition at the heart of openness. I think at the same time, the reason I'm thinking a lot about that moment now is because I think it is definitely very possible that we over-rotated on that concept and we're focused as a result of the things that were happening in 2011 on the benefits of that mission and the benefits of openness and weren't sufficiently focused on some of the drawbacks. That obviously is something that we've been focused on a lot in the last year, something that you heard our CEO apologize for um, in Congress last week. And I'm thinking about the events in Egypt in part, um, in part because I really hope that we invest in, um, in addressing some of the drawbacks of the of the platform that we've created with the same vigor that we, had, that we invested in creating openness in that period in 2011. And I am optimistic about it because of the, um, mm -hmm. the force that I saw the company invest in um, trying to achieve that mission. And as we've shifted away from um, uh, making the world more open and connected, bringing the world closer together, giving people the power to build community, um, I really do think that we are invested in trying to get, th get things right. I also think at the same time that it's really important that we learn the lessons of over-rotation and think about that a lot in the present moment. I think it's been really interesting hmm. to hear people say in the last 24 hours repeatedly, and I think for very good reason, that we need to think more aggressively about more open APIs, about interoperability as a way to deal with some of the issues that we see um, in the current markets. Um, and I thought Ben Thompson made an excellent point yesterday where he said Mark Zuckerberg was in front of Congress last week because of interoperability. One of the changes that we announced is actually limiting the amount of information available via our, our APIs and limiting it because of the attention that we've received and because of the awareness that we now have about how that information can be misused. So I'm not saying that because I think that um, interoperability is dead or that we should constrain our APIs even further necessarily, but I'm saying it because I think the decisions that we're making in this moment have real trade-offs um, and have trade-offs in terms of future innovation. We need to be really sensitive to that in the present moment. What do you mean, what, be more specific about your concerns about over, over rotation? You, so I think what I just said about interoperability is a really good one. So I think um, there is a trade-off between openness and data protection. So the more information that you make available in an API, the more robust that information is, particularly information about the social graph. So the social graph is about information not just about you, but the, about the connections that you have with, your, with friends. And that means if that data is really easily shareable, you can take it instantly to any service that you want. There's more opportunity for misuse, and it's, there's more opportunity for misuse, not just of your own data, but also of the data of your friends. The current privacy push is going to ensconce Facebook's position and Google's position um, much more firmly than ever before. And the EU, for instance, is completely at odds with each other with its privacy policies and its um, uh, competition policies. Concentration. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I, I think that there. This is a profound point, by the way. Excuse, yeah. excuse, excuse me. That's an important point. I, I, so I, I agree with the point, but I think it depends hugely on the architecture mm -hmm. of how you do it. Because mm. I actually think there are architectures for setting that up yeah. with the right API structure where it could have the opposite effect. And the mm -hmm. reason is that there, you know, there's this growing move towards these uh, data vaults, personal data exchange services, et cetera. There's, there's about 18 startups that are doing uh, things like this right now that I've met with, and there's probably many more that I haven't. Uh, and what they're trying to do is have a service whose unique role is to be your fiduciary in that position and to separate that from all the other services that Facebook offers you. Mm -hmm. And I think the possibility of that reducing some of the potential asymmetries of information in the marketplace by separating out all the things that are great about Facebook from the role of data fiduciary, I think could be extremely important to both getting data protection right and opening up the potential but, competition. But again, space. you would hurt these poor people's ability to make money if you do that, wouldn't, wouldn't it? So I, I don't, I, mean, I, really I mean, feel for Facebook. I, I know that no one in the room will believe this. I don't think that that's the primary concern for us. I think the primary concern right now is making sure that people have a good experience in the service. I think the changes, the, the way that Mark approached the, the way that Mark Zuckerberg approached his testimony in Congress, and I think the changes that we've announced are not about a concern for what our revenue is going to look like next quarter. It's about a concern that we are hearing that people, that people are having a bad experience, and I think more than that, that people don't trust the product and don't trust the relationship that they have to our company, and they think that when they share information on Facebook, they're not going to have control over that information. That, to me, is a profound, we, we have recognized as a really profound issue and one that we need to solve in order to be a viable business for the long term. Right. It's, it's, it's self-serving in a sort of literal sense. You need, you, this is an existential 
The current debate but, is an existential threat. But, so but the problem is that the, the market structure problem is that nobody can compete with Facebook on the basis of saying we have a different model and a model where our incentives are more aligned with your incentives yeah. and I can grow enough so I have a business too and then we can have the market um, take care of you know who do people trust um, when there's only one place to go. Um, I think you know as as you know became clearer in. in in the testimony when Mark was asked, you know, so who's your competitor? Um, and, you know, um, the senator gave, uh, Graham Lindsay gave the example, well, if I'm not happy with my GM, I can buy a Ford. Well, if I'm not happy with how Facebook is treating my data, where do I go? Yes. And so I think as long as we don't find a way of solving that, we can't rely on the market to let people compete on, just like Volvo said, we're going to compete on building cars that are safer uh, and not on something else. Um, it's very hard. So, for instance, let's switch to search for a moment. So, we're investors in a company called DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo competes That's with a good Google. Name. Uh, competes with Google by basically saying our search is much worse than Google Search. However, we won't track you. We won't filter bubble you. We won't keep track of any of your searches. Uh, it turns out that every time Google does something kind of weird and obnoxious, DuckDuckGo grows. Um, so, there is a demand for that, hmm. and. Uh, in search, it's a lot easier than in social to actually kind of go and build something that's separate and can grow. It's not super easy, but it's easier. I want to come back to the, to the, to the concentration issue with Facebook. Start with Matt and get, get all, all of your um, perspective. The, um, I, wrote, I wrote a poorly timed article just before, <laughs> but just before all of this came out where I quite frankly, praised Facebook's business strategy of buying Oculus, of buying WhatsApp, of buying Instagram, and said they've pursued a very intelligent portfolio uh, approach, knowing that, that Facebook has some vulnerabilities in terms of young people thinking it's not cool and so on, and this was a very intelligent approach. I clearly wasn't talking to Guy enough because what you're arguing, and I think maybe what you're arguing, I'm not sure, Elver, is that, that you know, Facebook is using its balance sheet to, to squelch competition. I, I don't think that's true in all of those cases. I think you have to distinguish between yeah, the cases what, because yeah. I think the Oculus case is a case where I, where I would say that's a clear complementarity. I mean, I don't see how Oculus is a substitute for the services that Facebook's offering. On the other hand, WhatsApp and Instagram Both do them. really worry me. So I, I really think that you have to you have to look at these things and 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 what's good for the bottom line uh, for the balance sheet of Facebook is not necessarily what's good for consumers. There's a really interesting analysis if you look at the um, acquisition prices that companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook pay. It's very clear if they think something is a threat, the price goes way up, right? And if they think something is not a threat, they will be bottom fishers. Uh, absolute bottom fishers. So, um, you know, the price for WhatsApp was $19 billion um, when WhatsApp had no meaningful revenues. Um, and Still that's has very, no meaningful revenues. And that, that was very clear because less, it, was a, right? it, was well. a, it was a direct threat to Facebook Messenger and potentially to Facebook itself. If you look at Amazon's big a acquisition, like Quidzy, um, it's companies that were a direct threat to Amazon. Amazon, we have had other interactions with Amazon. Amazon, when something is not a threat, but kind of could be nice, they will try and pay the lowest price or just simply put the company out of business. But, but, so, but, so, so I think that's something like there's a lot of economists in the room. I think you know, there's been enough M&A activity. You could probably calculate some you know, strategic the, the, the other thing I would say about premium. that is, is it's true on the labor market side as well, which is something that's not looked at as enough. You know, one thing that has really been worrying me increasingly in recent years is the buy for the engineering team trend uh, in a lot of these AI companies because that channels all the rewards to some guy who founded you know, some team from some university rather than to the actual talent, which you'd have to bid up the salaries of engineers to recruit. So I think it's happening on both sides. Yeah. And Elver, go well, ahead. This is exactly we my point. We have to come back to Matt on concentration, yeah. but go yeah. ahead. No, but this yeah. buy the engineering team, you buy, you see, what are they, Uber drivers? You should buy some Uber drivers. How much do they make? A million a year? You know what people pay for engineers? A million a year. Big whoop. Why wouldn't engineers, why wouldn't engineers who invented all of this stuff, right? We've subtracted the ability for, for the innovators to protect their innovation. Here's what's really happening. Right? We've taken the focus off of rewarding genius and innovation to rewarding capital and scale. So to your point on venture capital, now there's so much money in Silicon Valley. The idea is just, just go really fast 
get to scale as New fast York. as you can. <laughs> and once you have scale, you don't care about anything else. No, but let me, let me give you a point on, on Twitter, right? So Twitter went out. Twitter got caught up in this anti-patent movement in Silicon Valley more than anybody. So Twitter went out publicly and said, we're never going to enforce our patents, right? They said, you know, we, we, we no, hate No, what patents. they said is we will never assert our patents uh, offensively. Offensively, that's right. I, I was coloring for, for a, a lay audience. But yes, we'll never <laughs> I think this is not a lay audience when it comes to patents. <laughs> so Twitter said, we'll never assert our patents offensively. It wasn't uh, maybe a year later, uh, Mark Benioff goes on Charlie Rose. This is on YouTube. You can look it up. And he says, quote, he says, oh, we just started this great new thing. I'm really excited about it. It's called Chatter. It's just like Twitter, but for enterprise. You know what they paid Twitter for that? Chunk. And, and you know, what did what, WhatsApp pay Twitter? What did, what did uh, Facebook pay Twitter? Zero. I, and I, I think that's great. Personally, I think I it's think great. That's great. I think it's great because a world where Amazon can get a patent for one-click shopping, which should have never ever been awarded, it was completely no, no, obvious don't, don't at confuse, the time. Don't confuse. I, no, an the, the world is full of completely obvious. No, no, no. Every single one of our companies that gets to any scale gets sued by non-practicing entities over patents that they scooped up in the software space that should have never ever been issued. They are for stuff that's completely obvious to anybody in the practice in the art. Okay, hang on, and Albert. So, so I, I think. Yeah, and then they wind up going after not just the companies, but the company's customers. And as a result, the companies are often forced to settle, even when they have a really good case. We have very few portfolio companies that then have the stomach to go, no, we're just going to go and take this all the way in court. Cloudflare has recently done that and had a resounding victory, but, but it's really hard to do. I want to I want to ask you to pause beating up on Elver, because I want to beat up on Elver <laughs> on the subject of, of acquihires. Um, these teams of engineers, they, they don't, they didn't bring anything other than their PhDs to the, uh, to the equation. It was That's the entrepreneur something. who brought that Why team together. Why would you say such an awful thing? They're just hired. <laughs> and by the way, you got to need a, you by the way, I can, a, I can you prove need it. You a hip implant tomorrow <laughs> and, and with, well, with the drinking so much coffee, you're going to need a defibrillator. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're going to be thankful for those engineers. You're going to be thankful uh, for guys like me who slaved away in some lab at Yale try to bring you that I'm, stuff. And you're not going to say, well, let's just pay you, I'm you know, the little aqua hire I'm wage, a little better than the Uber driver. I'm grateful to you, but, the, but I can prove that those men and women brought nothing to the table other than their PhDs because if I offer them a hundred thousand dollar bonus they're gonna walk across the street to some other yeah, cause entrepreneur. Yeah, because they didn't take economics classes like I did okay. in undergrad. Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. What's your remedy? Quickly, what's your remedy? No, quickly, the remedy is I think we, we, we uh, find the balance. I, I agree with you exactly. Most of our clients are really hurt by patent trolls. It's a pain in the neck. And I think in, in you know, um, in the shift to deal with patent trolls with, with um, unintentionally or intentionally, it doesn't matter, but we eviscerated patent protection for small companies. Now it's got up to uh, middle market companies, right? $5 billion companies that have no patent protection. Okay. Everybody has less than 1,000 patents, basically has no patents. Okay. I, I want to come back to it, it. This is part of the concentration discussion, but bringing it back, Glenn, so, Glenn partly took the side of the big five and partly didn't. Yeah. So go ahead and address that, Matt. Yeah, so I think, I mean, one way to summarize, I think what I heard a lot of the conversation being about yesterday is do we have the tools or do we not have the tools? Um, and I thought the late afternoon panel um, provided some really interesting insight into that and I thought was really suggesting um, it may be possible that we should, we should develop additional tools and we should go further, but the tools that we currently have, including merger review, are quite robust and we could look at those things more aggressively potentially in the future and I, I think that that's a totally fair path to examine. Um, I, I, I guess the, the one thing that I would say just sort of in pushing back on the, like, um, I think conventional wisdom that the acquisition of Instagram is obviously anti-competitive is that there are a number of pro-competitive benefits. I think people assume that the Instagram that we have today was inevitable and that that's not at all the result of Facebook being able to invest in the company, grow the engineering team, that they were able to use Facebook infrastructure wasn't actually an advantage for Instagram and in growing and becoming the business it is now. Um, and so I think that that's something that's important to consider as we look at, at future acquisitions. And I, would, I mean, my bias guy, there, there isn't one company that was dominant when I arrived in Silicon Valley in 1997 that is dominant, that is dominant today. Not well, the, one. But the reason was, Microsoft. I mean, this, this, <laughs> well, the, but, but this Microsoft has done well, I'll give you that, but I, I'll stick with my well, statement. Go the, ahead. the interesting <laughs> thing that happened is we had a, you know, we had not one, but two platform shifts, right? I mean, 
Microsoft was dominant in the age of desktop computing. Then we had the platform shift to the web. Then we had the platform shift to mobile. Yeah. Um, absent platform shifts, these things can last a very long time. I mean, Microsoft lasted several decades when there was no platform shift, and they exerted extraordinary power. Yeah. So now, of course, yes, and then we they are, lost we, it. We, I mean, we are active investors in blockchain companies, and there's a glimmer of hope that we can build sort of a decentralized infrastructure that will have a lot of the things we just talked about baked in. But personally, you know, and I'm very close to this sector, we're talking about a decade plus um, before that, you know, will be have widespread consumer adoption. Ronnie, you have a question. Yeah. Tell everybody who you are, just so everyone knows. By the, oh, sorry, getting crushed by uh, the way in which the system has been uh, changed. I also hear a lot of, I think, um, well-meaning people on the other side saying, look, the nature of innovation has changed. These companies are using lots of different pieces of IP. They're using data. They're using, you know, we need a whole different way of thinking about this. In, in some ways, I feel like we are making an industrial revolution type shift in the economy, which requires every single thing you know, in the regulatory environment to be rethought. Antitrust, the patent system, privacy, um, you know, across geographies. Obviously, you know, we're not living in an ideal world. That's not going to happen. But are there any, is there, is there a case? Is there a historical analogy? Is there something that people like me that write about this should be thinking of mm. to, to come up with best practices here? Sorry, complicated question, but... I, I believe the shift we're going through right now is as profound as when we went from the agrarian age to the industrial age. And I think the biggest mistake we're making in politics across the board is that we're treating it as another iteration on the industrial age. I think it's the biggest mistake. So I'm with you. We need to change everything. It may not be the biggest so, mistake we're making on the political stage. But <laughs> so, so no, no, it's the mistake It's the mistake that got us to Trump and Brexit. It's, the, it's, it's claiming that we can fix the industrial age that got us to Trump and Brexit, not the other way around. So I, I, my, my perspective is that we... It's not too much patents or too little patents. It's that we don't have smart mechanism design, is what That's I would right. call it, to differentiate cases where there's effectively complementary patents that are stacking up royalties and blocking progress, which is incredibly important in tech for all these component reasons. And it's why the medical space for all its problems is much less problematic than what's happened in the tech space. But on the other hand, there's lots of cases where it's just, it, it genuinely is, uh, uh, you know, a failure to protect. So I, I, I don't have really time to go into all the things, but there, there are some very smart things that have come out of the economics of mechanism design about alternative property arrangements that I think we really have to be thinking about okay. because they can help sort out these cases in a more eff effective way. Elva, did you want to? I, I did. Um, I, a couple of things. One, um, there's a huge blind spot when we talk about innovation. And everybody thinks of innovation as Facebook, Microsoft, Intel, all of this. That's not the entire innovation. There's an entire ecosystem of suppliers, of software companies, Absolutely. of innovators, all the way down to universities that feed uh, the top of the machine. But in, in PR, what we read in the press is only these companies. So, so there's, there's a huge problem that we're not really, we're not really uh, there's no real discourse with the people who are below the top 10. Right? It's a winner-take-all economy right now, and it's all about scale and billions of dollars invested in a very small number of startups. So there's a handful of superstars, and we're ignoring the rest of America to our peril. Right? Hillary Clinton did uh, right in the last election, ignore the huge chunk of America that, that the other guy didn't. Please, right, right there first, and then we'll come to you soon. Thank you. No, no, yeah. I wanted to uh, play devil's advocate with Adam's first comment that we're, we're seeing more innovation than we've ever seen. Yeah. If you look at um, adoption curves for technology, these S curves of, of adoption, yes. they've been getting faster and faster. So technologies are getting adopted more quickly today. In other words, adoption of the internet, smartphone, broadband quicker than television, radio, automobile, et cetera. Uh, there's a ton of capital out there in being invested in a lot of different startups. If you believe uh, Naval Ravikant, he talks about the, a, a lot of people being sucked out of Google, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, to go work in cryptocurrencies and decentralized systems. 
which I know Albert is invested in as well. And that is thought of as being a solution to the, the problem of, of centralization today. Historically, everything has been disrupted by a new paradigm shift. Uh, and it's, it wasn't regulation, uh, some people will argue, that brought down Microsoft. It was, it was Google, it was the internet, it right. was all these other S curves that came after. So why, why is that process broken? Uh, and if it's not broken, then why are we so worked up about this? Because innovation will continue regardless. Well, let me just take cryptocurrencies as an example, right? So um, how are you ultimately as a consumer going to access this? It's through your phone. How do you get apps on your phone? There are exactly two companies in the world that get, let you get apps on your phone. And those companies have no interest in letting you do cryptocurrencies easily and well, because they're taking a 20 to 30% cut of everything that happens in the app store. So we have structural issues that I think are impeding, potentially, some of these S-curves that are coming. And I think that's what competition policy should be about. It should be a dynamic view of what's the next potential S-curve and how, how are the current incumbents potentially impeding that S-curve from taking off. I just want to make a very quick observation that everything I've heard so far, the, it's curious to me that you haven't talked about China at all. It's possible that you're limiting your thinking yeah. to, what, to what the Chinese may do. Now, that's getting less likely in the... In the, in, the, in the very short term, but still. I mean, China is a great example to me. China did not have an app store monopoly. That's how WeChat was able to build commerce into a chat application. When one of our portfolio companies tried to put some commerce into their chat application, Apple kicked them out of the app store. Gotcha. Please. Matt, um, assuming it'll take five years for Glenn's data fiduciaries to be built to keep my data and then give me permission to let you have it, for certain reasons, given the GDPR and all this other stuff, would you let me stay on Facebook with only minimal information available to you, meaning my age, my sex, my where I live, you know, maybe a couple other things, but not my religion, my political views, my deepest desires of, you know, shopping, whatever. So the short answer, I think, is yes. I mean, I think obviously it depends what you share on Facebook. But like one of the things that we're rolling out uh, pursuant to GDPR, for instance, is actually showing some of that more sensitive data to people and asking them if they want to continue to have it on Facebook. So okay. I, could, I could continue to use Facebook but not share all. You wouldn't be using all the stuff that I posted as a way to advertise to me and other things to me. Basically, yes. Yeah. I mean, to, to slightly yeah. defend uh, Madden and his position, one thing I would emphasize that I think is really important for people to be aware of is that there's a problem with data protection with Facebook, but there's a huge problem with all the apps that are on your phone. Go and look at how many people you are sharing your location with and think about who that could be sold to and how little incentive that actor has to do anything to worry about that. There's a lot of, of really worrying things that do come from the extreme part of openness that's not correctly architected that I think you have to keep in mind as well as the situation with the big five. Yeah, so. but, but this is back to the point of, of winner take all. We've set up the whole system so that it's winner take all. So on the, app, on the apps that you discussed earlier, we don't really have a system to have that trickle down to everybody else. Uh, Rana, back to your question. Uh, we have the system in movies, incidentally, right? Around copyrights and movies. So everybody in the, in the, in the, when making a movie gets a little cut of the royalty <laughs> of the movie because yeah. those rights were negotiated through unions, right? So uh, I don't know that that's the right approach here. But, uh, but the ability of, of everybody in the ecosystem to participate, what's basically happening is not that different than when you're a big you know, car manufacturer or whatever, XYZ manufacturer, and you just shift margins from your supplier back to you. Here, because of the network effect, you shifted all of the margins from all of the suppliers and all of the customers and everybody else back to you because you can. Um, and, and just if, if for my if for my better, if no one else's, please please just uh, tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm Teddy Downey. I'm an uh, executive editor at the Capital Forum. I have a question about you know the personnel and the policy, uh, the personnel and the procedure at at the Patent Office. Uh, and we were talking about this last night. It, it wasn't a Google. Uh, patent person in this important office and like is there, is there an issue with like the, the people who are there and how they're actually going about evaluating the obviousness of the patents and is there any change just in terms of like how they do that that you could that, that we could see that would improve things without necessarily changing the law yeah, it's a major constitutional issue um, 
the Supreme Court now uh, is, uh, there's a case in front of the Supreme Court called Oil States versus Green Energy uh, that's challenging the constitutionality of these uh, patent proceedings inside the patent court. Part of the problem is that the law, American Invents Act, the law gave a lot of freedom to the head of the patent office on how to set up these courts. So they look like Article III courts, right? There's hearings, there's two parties, there's briefings, there's all of this stuff, but there's no Article III judges and there's no jury. Right? These are just uh, administrative appointed uh, people. So the, uh, Obama appointed the head of the patent office, and the head of the patent office appointed all the patent court judges. So whoever had influence on Obama, without naming names, had the influence <laughs> on, the, on the patent court uh, <laughs> judges that are killing 70% of patents. And it, you know people scream bias when something like this happens. Is it right or wrong? We'll let the Supreme Court decide. So we're, uh, we're, the room is exploding with questions, which is wonderful. So let's just have quick questions and, and as quick answers as we can. Go ahead, please. Just a quick comment. Uh, oh, to, to you are, I'm sorry. Dick Schmalensee from MIT. Just Great. want to um, uh, underscore your comment about no discussion of China. I spent uh, some time in Southeast Asia a few weeks ago, and nobody talks about Amazon. They talk about Alibaba. Yeah. Alibaba yeah. is a very impressive company. Yep. Uh, in Jakarta, there are four internet-based unicorns alone. There's an active, innovative community. Uh, the the notion that the world is Silicon Valley, yep. I think, is is wrong and becoming wronger. And I wonder what the panel's reaction is. Uh, Glenn, I, I I think we have to ask your your thoughts on that. Um, I, I think I think that is a very narrow perspective. I don't know how a competition is going to work in the United States. Uh, I think that's going to develop pretty soon, actually. Uh, there's been a huge move, I just know, in the labor market side of things, of people who are my colleagues who used to be working at research labs and Google and so forth moving over, or us competing in the labor market for people moving over to Alibaba's uh, increasing presence. And the thing is, when those guys come in, they're they're huge. They just come and they take hundreds and hundreds of people. So I, I, I don't really know how it's going to play out. They have a very different model. Their perspective on the privacy issues and so forth is sort of just inherently very different than, than what's going to be acceptable in Europe and the United States. And that's such an important part of competition in this market. But I, I think it's a very interesting question. And it's question. worth pointing out, they have antitrust mechanisms, it's, but we don't, yeah. we don't yeah. understand yeah. them very well. I think you had a question, please. Hi, Caroline Holland, uh, Mozilla Tech Policy Fellow. I was really intrigued by the conversation we had about APIs. I've been looking at how do we, how can antitrust policy or other policies address the structural issues? Um, I am not optimistic that antitrust can handle it. There may be a few instances yeah. where they could use open APIs as a structural-ish, behavioral-ish remedy. But um, beyond that, how do, as a policy do we get at promoting open APIs that are done responsibly, and I think Matt has a really good point, there may be trade-offs between competition and privacy, and maybe those can be solved by you know very, very strong disclosure so consumers can decide who gets access. But how can we promote open APIs, promote these policies from a policy sense? Is that something that could question. be done by the FTC? I, is that something that could be done yeah. by know Matt, some other organization? Matt, uh, 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 Albert wants it, but Matt, how would we do it? Yeah, so, so there are smarter people on the specifics of how we would regulate it. But I guess I, one thing that really struck me in the hearings last week is, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we were asked any questions about interoperability. We were asked an enormous number of questions about privacy. That's I've, covered, yeah. I've covered a, a lot of issues and in, in a lot of different issues in my time at Facebook and even like the hardest, thorniest issues, the winds sort of blow in both directions. Like on an issue like encryption, for instance, there are people on both sides of the debate. Uh, we talked a bunch about Section 230 yesterday. There are vigorous voices on both sides of that debate. One thing that I think that was really striking last week is there were not voices on both sides. I think one thing that would be really useful is for the antitrust community to talk in more detail about interoperability and talk about the trade-offs with privacy so that at least those discussions can be more balanced. And hopefully that would then fuel a discussion about some of the more specific governance regimes that might actually help to protect both interests. I, I promise I'm going to come around the room, but I want to go to Gary. Uh, I'm Gary Reback. Uh, one quick observation, then a question for Matt. Um, we had a long discussion last year at this program about the effectiveness of, of U.S. antitrust laws. The notion that uh, Google brought Microsoft down and antitrust didn't is just total baloney. I'll talk about it in the last panel if I have time. We talked about it at great length. I have a question for Matt. Um, Matt, I'm not on Facebook. 
I don't want to be on Facebook. I've never shared any data with you. I don't want to. <clears throat> Maybe somebody put my picture on Facebook without my permission. The only time I've ever gone to Facebook is to check some Stanford University sites that are only on Facebook. Okay? I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> I What's understand your from your CEO, you're nevertheless profiling me, you're inputting data about me, you're selling information about me. Would you commit today to stop doing that, please? So, so there's, a, there's a blog post that we uh, released earlier this week on that topic, which I'd suggest you read. It has to do with the way that, like, third, that... Would you commit to stop doing it? So, so you can opt out of that type of advertising, actually. But like the way that the data collection work often has to do with things at the browser level. Would you stop? Would you commit to stop <laughs> doing it? What's the blog post called, or how, what are some terms? So it's, a, it's at the top of the newsroom. I, I, I would also In just Facebook. say. I, I would also just say the sort of the opening of your question about uh, about your desire. Would you commit to stop doing it? <laughs> so yes or no, sir. <laughs> so um, you. you, you you, you, it's not funny. Yeah, so that, that's you, fair. You can opt out of the monetization component. I don't want you. Uh -oh, okay, so, did you commit today or not? But but there's a fundament there's a fundamental structural issue with the internet and its current design, which is that any site can serve up code from any other site, and um, I think it's virtually impossible. Um, for a site that makes any kind of service available where it says, look, you know, here's um, a widget that you can run, that site's servers will start collecting data on any site where those widgets run. And it, it's sort of baked into the structure of the internet. Now, there's other questions about what that company is then going to go do with that data. But the fact that this data collection occurs is literally part of the protocols that power the internet. So uh, I, 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 I'm very sympathetic to this idea that why is it that when I do stuff on the internet, um, stuff gets tracked in many different places that I don't control. On the other hand, it's that very fact that's given us a crazy amount of innovation. Um, I, 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 we're going to come around this way. I just have a, a quick observation, Gary, which is that I don't need your permission to put your picture in Fortune magazine. And that's the remedy. That's the direction I would like to go. They're a media company, even though Matt and Mark Zuckerberg say they aren't. And that would, that would be a way of getting at that. But, but let's keep getting more questions. Go ahead. Uh, uh, ben Thompson, Shashakri. Uh, I guess I would ask Albert. Uh, uh, Albert's made the point that he believes this is a fundamental shift in away from the industrial age to a completely new age internet age, which I, for you know, completely agree with. And I guess what is um, your sort of full-throated defense of patents, which me being from the tech industry is certainly something I'm not used to, uh, to, to, to say the least. Uh, to what extent do you see that as not being a relic of the industrial age? and actually is pertinent to these future things because you keep attributing sort of human agency to these companies' dominance, when my view, as I presented yesterday, is that it is inherent to the structure of the internet that there be these sort of like demand-owning entities. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, every time people have gone against the wisdom of the founding fathers, sooner or later they, uh, they were found wrong, right? So. Yeah, that's not I, I don't know an about that. <laughs> no, no, no. There, was, there was something called the Civil War, actually. No, no, but, you no, know. no, 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 no. The basic, the reason I bring this up is the basic concept is the basic concept is what do we want to reward, right? Do we want to reward innovation? Do we want to reward innovation, or do we want to reward capital and network and market power? And 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 the, the issue here is that. There's just a blind eye of, of all of these discussions and so many panels that, that, that I'm on and that I, that I listen to is the label of innovation has been grabbed by, by everybody who's large. The issue of concentration is a serious issue because all the discussion happens up here. It's all policy decisions. It's all that. We've left out everybody else and the possibility to bring innovation up. And there's no recourse. right? We're shutting the door. The issue here is that we're shutting the door for the new Facebooks and, and others Patents is one system. Maybe it's outdated. Let's refresh it. But it's not the patents that's the problem. It's the App Store. It's the same issue here. Ignore patents altogether. It's App Store is the same thing. It's blocking access, right? It's breaking that link between the innovator and the market, the innovator and its market. Well, give, give Ben the mic, if you would, just a quick, quick follow-up. And then I want to go up there. Yep. Of course we're all pro-innovation. To suggest that your position is the pro-innovation position and the other one is not, I think, is to 
miss the point and a, a, a thing that is frustrating me about this conference in general, we've seen examples in this, pan, in this session alone, is an insufficient amount of understanding of exactly how this stuff works. And without that, and that stuff might be the systematic understanding of how the world works today, if Albert is correct, if it actually is fundamentally different, then if we do want to be pro-innovation, perhaps we do need to fundamentally re-examine the patent system or any number of other things. I want, I want to get the mic to Tim. What a collection of people in this room. Uh, Tim Wu from uh, Columbia uh, University. So I wanted to comment on the Albert and I guess Gary's uh, uh, discussion, other people's uh, discussion of S-curves and, and what, uh, you know, what makes uh, change happen. I think it's a big mistake to either be kind of market centrist or legal centrist. Uh, you know, to have the theory that, well, you know, it was all about Google having a better algorithm, that's why that, or to say it was all about antitrust. I mean, it seems like if you're going to be straightforward about this, they're, they're both forces, right? And that companies have, um, uh, you know, good reasons to invest in, in barriers to entry when they have a, a dominant position, and that can last for a very long time. I think about AT&T or something. And, you know, even AT&T was able to keep down uh, uh, better, better competitors or, or new approaches. Um, but, so antitrust plays a role, but it can't be the whole thing. I don't think a law you know, also determines everything. But it seems to me relevant to this question. Now, I guess I'm going to just direct this to, uh, to Albert and say, um, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you think that the thing we need to be figuring out right now, if everything is changing, as we're saying, is what really are the kinds of barriers to entry now, and are they different and maybe unrecognizable to yeah. our, uh, you know, what are the ways of rising rivals' costs that we don't really understand that well? And are there things that we're not really exploring because we have kind of a 20th century antitrust view of what, what counts as exclusion? Yeah, good question. Well, it, to me, it's, it comes down to what I said earlier about how much control do I as an end user have over computation, right? So <clears throat> I think um, whenever you share data with somebody um, because of zero marginal cost of copying digital data, that person now has a copy. And I think it is very difficult. I think a lot of the regulatory efforts in both market structure and privacy are aimed at behavioral regulation of what can the other entity do once it has my data. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'm more interested in what can I do uh, programmatically on my end, because the more I can do, <clears throat> the less power the other entity has, and so the less likely it's to abuse the data I've given it. So I totally agree with you, Tim, that I think it will take both uh, technological innovation remedies, such as building new systems that have security, permissioning, encryption built into them from the ground up, which the first version of the internet didn't, uh, and it will take regulatory approaches because these new technological approaches cannot really flourish until we have some regulatory approaches that give the end users enough power to participate in both systems more or less seamlessly simultaneously. I want to come right there and then and then to you. Uh, Megan, yes, Macon yesterday he said something very significant. He, he emphasized that we're going towards evidence-based more, that that's where he's going. So what I'd like to do here is, what would a reasonable person conclude of the data? Because I've got the data up for this panel. I can do it in like 30 seconds. But if you use the Internet Association, 43 companies, as a proxy for the Internet uh, market, you basically have the top three, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, are seven to eight times more uh, concentrated than the Fortune 500. Uh, if you go to the top 10 of those, it is 10 times more concentrated. What's the metric of uh, concentration? You're, you're uh, revenue. Okay. Uh -huh. and, then what you, um, and then if you go to companies bought, because I looked at you know, essentially what were those three companies and the others do in buying up folks. So if you look at uh, you know, Google, Amazon, and Facebook bought 345 companies, the Internet Association 900. Uh, Google bought 206, Amazon 77, Facebook 62, Microsoft uh, 2, 000, uh, 203. Uh, then if you look at the top unicorns today, uh, um, Google and Amazon own parts of 42% of them. And that would be 19 of 50 for, um, uh, for Google, and Bezos um, has mm. uh, 4 of 50. And two overlap, Uber and Airbnb. So the question is, is what, what would a reasonable person under evidence-based conclude about this overall uh, market and SPAC set? Uh, I'll ask anyone who wants to jump in. If no one does, Glenn, I'm going to ask you to. 
I, I think it's a little bit of a rhetorical question, so, uh, you know. Fair enough. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> please, please. We're almost out of time, but go ahead. I'm Carl Shapiro from UC Berkeley. Um, I think uh, this is a question for Albert with reference to Glenn. Um, as somebody in the antitrust side, I've, I know there's been pushing in the direction Glenn has suggested, which is to be more restrictive on some of these large companies buying startups that might threaten them. But then we always hear the venture capital community, that's terrible, you're getting rid of the exit strategy, and it's gonna be really, and a lot of these deals are actually quite good. So as a VC, you know, how do you react to that? Would that be scary or would that be welcome? Uh, everything has left the barn, right? I mean, I think <laughs> at this point, debating about what Microsoft, uh, what, what uh, Facebook, <clears throat> Amazon, Google still get to buy, I think is sort of, past the point. I mean, I think we're, now we're debating the past. Um, I, I, I think that... Um, no, I, no my, but my point, is, my point is, we are no longer investing in stuff, and I think very few people are, in stuff where the exit path is to sell to those folks because the likelihood they're going to want to buy it, um, you'd have to have something that you feel would actually compete successfully because all the other stuff gets bought for bottom dollar or put out of business. So it's just not happening. It's, we, we're, we're not investing in that kind of stuff. So I, and I don't think you'll find many other VCs who are. So I, it's just not happening anymore. So there wouldn't be an objective. No, 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 no. The would cause investment. No, but is, my is, point is the, the, if, you, if the antitrust enforcement is focused on future acquisitions, it doesn't deal with the existing market power at all. But isn't that on its face preventing innovation in those sectors? Who's no. going to fund that innovation? So, so, no. so I, 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 I want to make I, one, so one comment. I think we have to get used to the fact, because of the very nature of digital information, that all industries are going to have power law structures. They're not going to look like the industries we're used to. And so it all comes down to, if we're going to have power law structures, what can we do to limit the power of the folks that are at the head of the curve? And that will include some folks from China. That will so, include an Alibaba, a Didi, et cetera. But it'll be very few companies globally, so, very few companies. And all we need to do is how do we limit their power so that the rest of the distribution can also have some of the economics? I just very quickly want to say something to Carl's point, because John and I were writing a paper about this but never finished it. But the, the way that this distorts the structure of what gets invested in, I think if you think about that, about what things are funded, rather than, uh, rather than just the level of total funds entering the industry, I think you'll realize that it's not necessarily even going in the right direction of uh, being productive for the venture capital industry. So I, I, it, it pains me to say that, that, we're, that we're nearly out of time. There will be time for discussion in, in the break. But I do want to end with a, with a, on a superficial note. This is, to please, <laughs> this is to please my friend Guy, which is I want to ask each of you. Yeah, always Guy. I want to ask, I want to ask each of you. It, uh, to, to, uh, to comment on Guy's uh, question and premise that the, um, the leaders and founders of, of the Big Five will be remembered as the robber barons, the hated, hated robber barons of the 21st century. We'll start with you, Glenn. Uh, yes. Albert, <laughs> your friends and neighbors? Yeah, there's still time, but not much. Matt, I hope not. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think, I think they're thoughtful people. They're thinking about these issues heavily. And you know, I, th I think they see, they, they're getting a lot of feedback, and I think they'll adjust. I would note that Bill Gates clearly read his history, right, uh, and, uh, and, and pivoted in his career the way Andrew Carnegie did. Uh, thank you to all of you, and thank you to all of you. That was great. Thank really you great. very much. Really this great. is fun. Good. Good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.